Hey everybody, welcome to We've Got Worm, a Daily Planet Films podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss the hit web serial Worm week by week, arc by arc. My name is Matt Freeman, your host, and I have used my secret powers to take control of the body of my co-host Scott and forced him to read this book. Scott, I know the answer already, as I can feel all your emotions, but how are you doing this week? Well, Matt, except for the uh, severe emotional and physical trauma you've put me through, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, yes, in this good. podcast, you guide me, a first-time worm reader, through the gray morality that is Brockton Bay as I inspect, interpret, and yes, even speculate on what the story is and where it is going. This week, we are covering Arc 10 Parasite, which uh, has the dubious honor of, of making me feel more uncomfortable than any other arc uh, in this story. Well, that's great, Scott. I've I've been looking forward to a lot of the content of this arc for a long time, and I'm very glad that it made you uncomfortable. Yeah, and the interesting thing about this one with me is it it, it very much feels like a introductory chapter of a book, um, which kind of makes sense because we saw arc eight as the quote unquote end of Worm Book One, um, then arc nine was sort of an epilogue, and now this is a starting a new story. So there's Mm -hmm. a lot of setup here. Um, there's a lot of important information that, that we're learned, but, uh, um, I I wouldn't call it my favorite arc Mm -hmm. that we've been through. Um, there's some parts of this I didn't like as much as others. There's some parts of this I absolutely love. Um, but, um, it, it wasn't the strongest in my opinion. Yeah. I think my opinion of of this arc is that it's, it's bookended by two of the strongest and, and, and just most, I don't, I don't know, my favorite, frankly, like like just the best, um, some of the best parts of, of the story, but the middle part is relatively weak, um, especially compared to how, how strongly it begins and how strongly it ends. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, before we move on, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, we're now officially on the We've Got Worm podcast feed so we're not we're not posting on the daily planet anymore so if you're listening to this congratulations you you did it right and yep. um, and if you're not then uh sorry. i guess you're not hearing this sorry <laughs> um also uh if you want to follow me on twitter at got um i am still doing the uh live read throughs uh, of of every next arc and i've had such a blast doing that i had a lot more of you guys like respond to me this week and that's a lot of fun um so yeah you can follow that twitter and i usually start reading uh, the thursday after the episode so if you're listening to this on wednesday it'll be tomorrow at around noon is when i normally start um and and tune in and, and join the conversation it's a lot of fun i certainly will be <laughs> all right um yeah, so before we get into our beat-by-beat beat analysis this week, let's see what kind of questions and comments we got from our last episode. All right. So to start off, uh, Wildbo turned up, as usual, to offer some great insight on his process in writing and clarification on a few things that we talked about in the episode. Uh, as always, we don't want to go through his comments line by line, but we rather strongly suggest you head over to the Parahuman subreddit and relish the little nuggets that he feeds us as well. Um, also, he says he wants us to argue more. Yeah, well, Matt, you suck. I agree. Damn it. That's not well, arguing. I'm, well, I'm, I made you say that with my mind powers. So. Oh, tr- touche. Um, uh, Green Door thinks we're being overly hard on the PRT and their habit of treating people like tools to push their agenda. Scott, you were, I think you were the main one who was behind the PRT is being manipulative thrust so how do you what do you think about that yeah so i it's funny because i went back and listened to what i said after i started seeing because green door was one of the big commenters on this but he wasn't the only one who made this point um that i was being a little overly hard on them and and i think i think i came off more negative than i intended to be um my my goal was that this this goal that the prt seems to have of finding a way uh of all these people living together in harmony um, was very noble, but like anything else in the story, there is a flip side of that that is uh, kind of disturbing. So I wasn't saying that that the PRT as a, as a as a unit is wholly corrupt, although I think there are definitely very corrupting elements within it. Um, but there's also a dangerous side of this push for normalization that we've seen. So I, I came off more negative than I wanted to be. 
Yeah, I think another feature of the last arc was that, like, you have Pigot as the representative of, like, the bureaucracy and the, the, the administration of the PRT, and she's a very cold and detached-seeming character, at least in that arc. So um, it gives a negative impression of the whole organization. Maybe we'll learn more and we'll, we'll feel differently in the future. Yeah, and I think there is there is a, a large separation between the bureaucracy of the organization and the street level people because uh, the wards uh, are some of my favorite characters in the story. So I definitely like these guys, and they reflect on the PRT. So I wouldn't want to be too negative on them. Um, but, yeah, but it's the bureaucracy that that troubles me, and the, and the legal system, and and all these systems of authority that uh, that Taylor's been been railing against from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Pizza hot dog lover says, uh, "What do we think about some non-combat applications of the various characters' powers, and why do you think it is that we see so little use of powers outside combat?" I think that's a great question. Yeah, that's a really good question, and it's something that I've been thinking about that I thought about last week um, when we're looking at uh, the reconstruction or or seeming lack thereof of reconstruction going on in Brockton Bay, um, and I, I think like if thinking of specific non-combat applications is tough because i think if you look at the powers they 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 really do seem to be so combat focused like everything that these people can do seems to be combat focused and that's their default uh idea like i don't i don't know like taylor uses her bugs to build um her suit so like you could use bugs in a non-combat way to help people out like spider silk being some of the strongest things in the world uh you could construct things out of that but it just seems like they're all so tailored towards we need to use these to fight each other yeah i mean the 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 one that always springs into my mind as as like having a having utility would be someone like kaiser who who basically has matter generation um so it's like he's basically like a one-man metal production facility um but like he's just not inclined to do that you know it, like, like his personality he would just never do that he would just never be like oh good i can right. just hang back and make money so yeah i it's, like it, i yeah. liked vista's um ability to shrink a large amount of supplies into a small area um mm-hmm. we saw that a bit uh, when she was delivering the supplies to perry and i don't think we specifically called that out last week but that's uh, that's something really cool that could be very beneficial um and we see that one instance of it, but really nothing else. Um, yeah. So I, I, as as far as the second half of the question, why do we see so little use of the powers outside of combat? I mean, it just seems like human nature prevails and power creates conflict and conflict <laughs> creates fighting. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, like the, the the biggest thing that always gets me down when thinking about the story is just like, how well these powers synergize together and, and how well these people could improve the world if they just work together. And I know I've said that before, but I think about that a lot when we go through the story. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that's been slightly thematically lampshaded by the story itself, but I don't think it's really emphasized it too much yet. Um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, uh, next, next comment um, user that we're calling forevermore Jacobin <laughs> says um, one theme that they noticed was uh, death being explored through levels of lethality. So basically we have, um, we have deaths in the background and everyone deals with it by adjusting their levels of lethality. We have Flechette who takes her incredibly lethal power and uses, uses it to pin people to walls while shadow soccer smashes her non-lethal bolts to use them as glass shards so she makes them more lethal we have parian who avoids fighting at all we have the various wards versus the travelers with an almost comic tone uh playing out in front of these overkilled corpses uh and ballistic and sundancer are are actually like impeded in the fight because they're too lethal to use their powers whereas kidwin wants to be more lethal but he can't um and and then finally we end up seeing that sophia's like for, for sophia lethality is almost her entire like worldview um I, this is I, I almost read the whole comment there because it was i thought it was really because well, yeah comment. it's spectacular yeah. and it yeah. i i love this idea 
Um, and I love how it fits into everything that we're talking about. Like we talked a lot about uh, grief and the stages of grief in the last episode, but yeah, I mean, this is, we're seeing kind of the response to this escalation and some people, their response to that escalation of violence is to back down from it. Um, and some people, their response is to double down on it. And yeah. uh, I, I think that's really cool. And that's a very insightful observation. But I'm bored, Jacobin. To... Yeah. I think it's fun to think about stuff like that. Cause like, imagine, you know, every, every kid and, you know, teenager and adult and so forth fantasizes about getting uh, superpowers, you know, but usually you fan- you don't fantasize about getting the ability to turn any object near you into a bullet <laughs> yeah. be- because it's like, okay, well n- the scenarios that opens to me are all very violent and unpleasant. It doesn't, you know, it's, you're, you're not Superman. You're just like, Oh, I, I'm a killer. Right. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, um, the, the powers definitely lend themselves to different levels of lethality automatically. And I think that's yeah. very interesting. And I really do love that, uh, contrasting image between, uh, these terribly mutilated corpses and, and Jacobin's actually right. This, um, this comic level of fighting between mm-hmm. these two teams, like it, it there is a, a lot to that, that very distinct difference. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it does kind of show how these people deal with this kind of stuff. And that you're, you're right. Like Sundancer, we've we've actually seen her use more utility with her orb in this in that fight than we had and in other places because it was just she's not going to want to kill anyone. So she can't really do a lot, um, but she uses it for the steam and, and just as like a wall to block people. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a really good comment. I, I would love to pay attention to this as we go forward, especially as we bring the, the slaughterhouse nine into it and their seeming level of, of gruesome for the pleasure of it, uh, violence and, and killing. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. So uh, as always, we thank you all so much for your comments and questions and criticisms. We want this series to be as interactive as possible. So if you want to participate in, in the discussion, check out the Reddit thread or shoot us a tweet or an email and we will respond or try to. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we, we do really appreciate it. And we don't even get close to answering half the questions these days. Like we get so many questions and comments that we can't uh, get close to covering them all. But uh, we, we are still reading them. The ones that we know we're not going to talk about on the, the podcast, I try to answer on the Reddit thread. Um, but we still don't even get to all those. But uh, keep asking. We will get around to you eventually. Yeah, that's right. All right, Scott, let's move into Parasite. All right. All right so we open with the Undersiders plus new member Imp carrying an unconscious shadow stalker to an abandoned building. They use their powers to scout it, and then they choose an apartment to occupy. Yeah, uh, you know, I think the more I think about it, the more... My favorite part of Wild Bo's writing is his introductions and the first few sentences of a chapter, um, because in this chapter we have Taylor as they're they're searching through this apartment complex, kind of just talk about the state of the city um, and how it's basically become this big trash heap with people just throwing away their trash. Um, and then in this situation, the bugs of Brockton Bay have thrived, mm-hmm. um, and I love this idea of. Uh, that this is like a clear indication of things to come that come that, that things have gotten bad in this world, but the bugs and therefore by extension, Taylor um, have kind of come into their own and are thriving uh, in this ruinous landscape of a city. Yeah, that's a great observation. So we, we note that Rachel is obviously still angry with Taylor, but everybody else at least seems to be behaving professionally. It doesn't, there doesn't seem to be a lot of baggage, whatever has happened. We, we don't, we don't actually know what's happened, but we know that, Everyone's back together. Yeah, and this is a really cool uh, kind of twist on the whole she thinks like a, a dog type thing because dogs are friendly and loyal, but if you betray them, they've done studies that they will they will grow to mistrust you very quickly after they learn that you were going to lie to them. So interesting. Yeah, um, they they did a whole study about it actually, where like I think it was like a human pointed to um, a, a a thing that had a dog treat into it in it and the dog like believed him and opened it up and it was the treat in it and then they did it again into an empty container that didn't have a dog treat and then like the third time the dog just didn't believe the human anymore it's like no you lied to me i don't believe you anymore that Um, makes sense so yeah so like it's it's just really cool kind of play off of that yeah i i could never trick my dog into going outside when i was a kid (laughs) 
you'd think that a human could trick a dog, but no. So uh, Tattletail deals with Shadowstalker's PRT gear and her phone and her tracking devices while Regent ties Shadowstalker to a chair with extension cord. Yeah, so, and this may be a question that you can help answer. Um, like, we see now that the team is aware of the electricity weakness, so the the moment where uh, Taylor, like, positioned herself to get the, the electrified fence in between the two of them was not just her thinking quickly or um, having insight. It was just, like, the team was kind of planning this whole thing. So, in your opinion, was this whole thing, like, Taylor going up and stealing the food from the truck... Um, all just a ploy to bait Shadowstalker into getting kidnapped by them? I think it may very well have been. Um, you know, it like that particular ploy might not have worked and they might have tried again, but I think I think they knew enough about Shadowstalker to know that she was kind of a loner and that they would be able to like eventually get her in a one-on-one, especially because they they suspected that she would try to chase Taylor because she knew that you know skitter knew her identity i don't know if um you know they didn't know that she would try to murder taylor necessarily um but then i think that that was kind of a safe assumption uh, yes i mean to answer your question directly I, I do think that um that it was a trap i don't think taylor had any specific interest in those supplies okay That's yeah I, 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 th- I think you're probably right um and i think we know that coil has like spies on the inside of the PRT so like he would know who's out on patrol and what general area they're patrolling um so they could use that kind of information to their advantage um i think it's interesting mm-hmm. that if they're going to try to infiltrate they picked shadow stalker and it's probably just because of the loner uh, aspect that you mentioned but i'm sure there's a little bit of something of of taylor's preconceived uh biases against her yeah i kind of wonder even if uh they if like the purpose of Taylor appearing there was to try to lure just any PRT member to follow her. And then they would have captured whoever ended up following her. Yeah. And it just so happened to be shadow stalker, which lucky for them. Cause yeah, that could be, I mean, that's, it's all, it's all plausible. I think. So shadow stalker eventually wakes up from the tranquilizer dose that they gave her with her own crossbow bolts and at first she's she's stoic in the face of their you know in the face of the situation but then regent takes the four and she realizes what's going to happen but of course we still have no idea as the readers because this has been withheld from us so regent instructs that grew gag her and then quote give them some privacy so whatever and and uh, whatever he's going to do could take 15 minutes or three hours so everyone just just leaves yeah i really like the Mm -hmm. ominous nature of this moment um I, first of all there's some really interesting word usage here like taylor refers to shadow stalker as a heroine um but can't like she has to put it in quotes she's not mm-hmm. she's not a heroine she's a quote-unquote heroine mm-hmm. um but then yeah there's this really clear shift in tone like sophia's kind of playing this off as arrogant and like the the hostage that's not going to tell anything um but then as soon as she realizes what they're actually doing, there is this absolute clear emotional shift in her. Um, and, and I think the moment does land because we don't understand what's going on yet. I think that helps the moment land better um, because we're kind of in because we're not sure what's going on. But we have a very clear idea of whatever this is. If, if it scares Sophia that much, if she's that emotionally disturbed, it's going to be real bad. And uh, yeah. it, it ends up being <laughs> so. Yeah, right. And, you know, I think in the back of our minds at this point, we have that prior mention of of Regent's secret weapon. Um, and maybe if we were really, really paying attention, we have that reference to the three masters and the undersiders, only one of which is a real concern. Um, right, right. So so I think we're we're primed a little bit for this, but not, neither of those were really huge. Those were almost, those were really just kind of passing things that are at best, maybe, you know, unconsciously getting us ready. Um, yeah, yeah yeah so anyway while while they're waiting for regent to do his thing uh imp wants to watch tv and argues with guru about it because guru doesn't want light flickering in the apartment so eventually she goes to explore the abandoned apartment um and we note that there is some lingering tension within the group specifically regarding taylor yeah i really love 
that I mean this the most of this chapter is just us focusing on these character moments and watching how these characters interact with each other is like uh, catching you up on what the situation is. Um I I think it is funny that we're never like explicitly told that um that uh Aisha is imp anywhere in this arc. Like it's never told, but like we're given such big clues to it. Um mm-hmm. I mean in this moment, I think I tweeted it on, on the, the Twitter that was like, oh, so so Imp's totally Gru's sister, right? Just because the way they're talking to each other is so transparent, like the annoyance that she's bringing to him is different from his interaction with anyone else on the team and anyone else we've seen him with. So it's very obvious. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you're right that like every no one's getting along, really. Um, mm-hmm. Like even Gru and Tattletail are kind of cold to each other. And we presume that's because Lisa... Uh, backed her up originally but nobody seems happy with anyone and you're kind of curious how this is going to affect their chemistry as a team yeah right because i I think at this point what i was feeling that on my first read through i definitely remember like i loved these characters so much and i just loved their like plucky little band of 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 uh, comrades and so it really hurt when when something came between them and it looked like everything was falling apart. Um, I think that's a very effective, you know, writing trick is, is having an ensemble cast or whatever you want to call it, a bunch of characters and, and and you as the reader, like all the characters and you like that they like each other and you like that they get along. And then when they don't get along, as far as your monkey brain is concerned, it's like your friends aren't getting along and it worries (laughs) you and concerns you and upsets you even though they're not real, obviously. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I, and we'll talk about this more at the beginning of the next chapter, but I think the reason this works as well as it does is because we see them in media res, right? Like if we mm-hmm. had, if it had, the timeline had gone normally and we had seen her go to the undersiders and, and asked to be let back in and we saw that all played out and then saw this moment, I don't think that would have been quite as effective. But we're like, we, we take a, uh, an arc off from seeing these guys together and then we come back to them and immediately it's like things are different. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Taylor said that in the last arc in an mm. ominous way. Um, but in this, it's just like these guys don't seem to like each other anymore. And you're right. It is kind of a bummer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as, as they're waiting, um, Taylor seems to be working to convince herself that whatever it is that's happening in the next room is acceptable and deserved because it's Sophia. Yeah, I, I like this a lot, um, and I think we're going to basically table Alex's uh, power reveal <laughs> and talk <laughs> about it in his arc and talk about the moral implications and the ethical implications of all that later. Um, but I, I do think it's very interesting that Taylor is aware and reluctant of this, but still follows through anyway. And and what this made me think about, and I think we'll see it again through this arc, is that when Taylor has like a clear plan, um, when she like this has a has a very clear and defined goal and plan, it's a lot easier for her to justify um, a, a, an immoral act. It's a lot easier for her to rationalize away the bad things that she does. Um, it, it, we saw that you know her plan was to infiltrate the undersiders, um, and she was able to moralize away all these things. Once she abandoned that plan um the first ethical dilemma she's hit with is dinah and she just can't deal with it um yeah but then we see now she has a new plan she's going to infiltrate and get in with coil and and try to save dinah that way and now suddenly she's able to rationalize these immoral acts again yes well you see scott she has the best intentions and that's all that counts (laughs) of course of course no i I agree with you with with all, all of that totally um that's that's a great observation so yeah, while while they're waiting, Taylor's passively using her power to set webs across any entrances to the apartments, um, and she's also using the, the bugs to monitor the other undersiders. And she tries to read a book, but she can't really focus on it. But then suddenly, after some time, she notices Shadowstalker is no longer in her chair, although although Alec is still in his chair. And then just as quickly, Shadowstalker is behind Taylor, physically subduing her, and then stopping just before you know killing her, basically. But then Shadow Soccer starts laughing, and then Regent comes in laughing in the same cadence, and then we join in with him. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know if I was laughing, um, but I really, I loved this reveal. Um, you know, 
the funny thing is because i complained about that one reveal in the third episode <laughs> because i complained about that one reveal um anytime there's a big like reveal in the story um i kind of feel like i need to either declare whether i like it or not i feel like people are waiting for it now um so yeah i like this um i do think it's kind of pushing the limits of what uh, what uh, in narrative reveal is and what's just audience trickery but i do think it works because in narrative in story alec is just fucking with everyone yeah. and everyone's reaction to this are genuine because while everyone knows what alec can do uh, but we can't none of them have ever really seen it in action before so it works in world as a reveal as well as being a dramatic reveal for us the reader um mm -hmm. and i think that just just works very well um yeah that's totally i mean that's totally how alec would do that right based right. on everything we know about him he, he couldn't resist yeah yeah but i i do i, I do love just how this reveal recontextualizes him too, because we have all this information about him that we never really even thought about. Um, mm -hmm. And then suddenly under this new reveal, like it's like, Oh, of course, like he, mm -hmm. even his name regent is like, Oh, that makes mm -hmm. sense. All of a sudden um, his old name hijack, that makes sense all of a sudden. And even the power, like to control nerves and muscles and, and that kind of thing, like this seems like a natural extension of that. And I yeah. really like how that's done. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if we're told explicitly what it is, but you get the sense that when he's making people jerk around, that's just like the first stages of the process that would ultimately lead to him controlling them if he if he stayed around them long enough. Right. And that's why it takes him so long is because he's basically learning each nerve and each muscle and he's learning all those things. And, and that's mm -hmm. why it takes the three hours or whatever. Yeah. All right. So we move on to 10.2. Um, and we open on a flashback to the point in time when Taylor was attempting to rejoin the Undersider. So we find out what happened there. So she visits their new hideout, a building that was destroyed in, in the destroyed docks area, uh, re re rehabilitated by Coils Funds, accompanied by uh, Telltale. Yeah. So. I I usually don't like flashbacks. Um and and I'm kind of glad that we don't use them in Worm very much. I think the only other time we've specifically like flashed back and forth between two periods in time was that uh Lisa's interlude in the middle of Arc eight. Um and we only do it one time here. But I, I like it here because like we were talking about before, that um starting in media res with them and then coming back to this just I think helps you understand the state of the team quickly and then get an explanation behind it afterwards just seems like a better way of doing it than just telling it in a normal linear story yeah i think that i think that opening in, in media res was the better idea but then i think you also need to know certain details of how this went down um in order to right. understand exactly what happens later like like yeah you have to understand uh, I mean, I think it helps you to understand that Alex is, is about to stand up for her. You have to, it helps you to understand that Rachel is not happy with things, and, and this accomplishes that fairly economically. Yeah, I think when I think of flashbacks in, in in narrative and story a lot, to me what it is is we want to get to the exciting part first, and then we'll mm -hmm. go back and fill in the blanks for you after that, after we've hooked you. Uh, that's not what this is, and that's why I think I like it here where it would bother me in other places. Yeah. And also this isn't just, you know, merely filling in the blanks. This is actually a dramatic scene because you, you do want to know how she convinced them. Yeah, you're like right. You, yeah. Were, you were actually eager to find that out, or at least I was. Um, and, and it's, and it's interesting how it goes. So anyway, um, we, we see that Aisha is here training with Gru, which, you know, if we didn't already suspect that she was imp, I think this would be the, the clincher. Yeah, but again, it never actually says it. There's never mm -hmm. any, no character ever says, or Taylor never actually thinks Aisha is imp. Yeah, um, right. She just offhandedly kind of wonders, like, why is his sister here? Right. Um, so uh, one more thing. Are, are we, I guess, assuming that she triggered during the Leviathan attack at this point? I don't know if they, they, they offhandedly mentioned that they were, her and her father were attacked, but they didn't um, sp specify any of that. Um. Uh, I don't, I don't know if, I mean, <laughs> yeah, this is the, you can't 
tell me because yeah. you're not sure. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's it's not a big deal either way. But yeah, she definitely triggered since we last saw her. I think we can assume that. Okay. Yeah. Um, for some reason, I love the detail that Alec is eating a colorful bowl of children's cereal. Yeah, I mean that's just him, right? Like that's yeah. and and it fits in with all these things we learned about him later in the arc and and his childhood and how maybe he's never really emotionally matured past that stage. So uh, it's a really it's a really small beat, but yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. I, I noticed it too, so I was yeah. glad you included it in a yeah. here. And also that it's like it's a super stimulus food, like it's it's a food turned up to eleven to the point that it's not even really food anymore. But it's like. <laughs> the only type of thing that he can maybe even you know detect anymore yeah that's true uh but then when rachel sees her um she basically just walks up to her and punches her in the face taylor doesn't do anything to avoid the hit or defend herself even though she probably could Uh, and then lisa steps in to defend her but the boys don't and aisha doesn't uh and after a little bit of back and forth taylor asks to rejoin the team which um some people are more open to than others. Rachel <laughs> menaces her with a piece of wood <laughs> while being sort of held at bay by various other undersiders. Taylor tries to explain herself to the team, um, but they don't really buy, yes, I was going to betray you until literally a few days ago, but decided not to because Armsmaster was mean to me um, as an excuse. Yeah, I wonder why that didn't work out. Yeah, but so the, then she brings up her expression of romantic interest in Brian as another part of her reasoning for not turning them in, uh, which Regent certainly finds convincing because he, he he sort of stands up for her here. He's like, yeah, she she totally is into you, man. Even though Brian is like, oh, I don't know, I'm completely blind to these things. <laughs> um, and then she finally offers to give up a share of of her pay or give up her share of her pay. And then Alec is like, I'm sold, I'm sold. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the first time I read this, um, her uh, admission of her feelings for Brian came off as completely sincere to me. She was just trying to be honest with everyone. Um, and then I read it again, and it's just a strategy. It's just like a, a ploy to accomplish her goal of, I need to get back into the other side, or so I'm going to say whatever I need to say to win them over. Um, and that's it. like she knows the pay. She knows uh, the other members of the team. I-, I feel like she knows that that Brian, that this romantic interest thing is probably not going to work on Brian. Um, but I think she's betting it'll work on some other people. Um, I just think it's very interesting that um, she's playing them all here. And there's really no we don't see into her head at all about this idea of I want to be friends with these people again. She's she's kind of all business. It's yeah. all about getting back on the team so she can get to coil so she can get to Dinah. Yeah. I I also feel in this scene that, um, Brian kind of just wants her to come back and maybe misses her on some level, even though he's hurt by her. So, because he, he seems to fold really quickly and his justification is ultimately like, um, we're skipping ahead a tiny bit, but his justification is like, well, we need the firepower. And it's like, yeah, you you need the firepower, but didn't you just say you don't trust her and you're worried that she's going to mess up the teamwork? Like, isn't that more important than whether or not she brings firepower? At? So he, he, he just seems to really quickly justify letting her in. And I think that's because he wants to. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. Um, I think that he was embarrassed by the fact that he developed feelings for this person that betrayed them. So his pride was kind of the only thing standing in the way. And like, as soon as he felt things shifting towards her getting back in, um, he jumped aboard cause he knew he, he knew he could do it and have an argument for it. Um, that doesn't embarrass him. So I, I, I think, I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, and then, um, yeah, so basically Alex stands up for her and, and one of his reasonings is, is like just that Brian needs to have his head straightened out because there's been there's been tension within the group. And I think that's something um, that maybe th- we should highlight is that according to Alec, there's been there's been weird tension within the group since Taylor left. So it's not just because she's there. It's since she left, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like this moment a lot, too. And I also like this idea that Alec stood up for her, um, mm-hmm. this guy who's seemingly doesn't really care about anything and and his reasoning 
all make sense within his line of thinking. But it is kind of a, a little setup for what happens in his arc later. Um, and it, it, it's really, it, it's a subtle setup. Like, if you're not paying attention to it, you might miss it. But um, it, it just it just helps explain his actions later. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Rachel is totally not won over, but they just kind of move forward. And then we return to the present, or or rather, I guess, uh, slightly into the future <laughs> of, of the last scene. Um, so the Undersiders are attacking and quickly defeating a bunch of unpowered but potentially well-armed merchants. Suddenly, Shadowstalker swoops in from the sky. She defeats all the Undersiders with highly suspicious ease, and then she calls the PRT. Yeah, uh, I love how this whole part of the chapter starts with Taylor saying there are so many ways this could go wrong, um, because this goes so terribly wrong. <laughs> and I think we're going to talk in a bit about this whole plan and break out, break down um, what everyone was thinking. But right now, I'm just going to say, what was everyone thinking? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the the one thing, and, and maybe maybe this is maybe you won't like this either but the one thing that mitigates against all of that is that they know they have coil's power like they, they actually know that they have coil's power now yeah working for them so that like if if you knew that in the past they didn't even know that and they still did some pretty crazy things now that they know that they could just be like all right everybody balls out let's go and if if, the, if it doesn't work then that then that then Coy will just cancel that and and then tell them <laughs> later like hey uh, you guys uh, tried it and it was terrible um, maybe do it different next time or yeah but see that line of thinking starts hurting my brain because yeah. then the version of Taylor we're seeing is always the one that the the best <laughs> thing happens because if not then that version would just cease to exist so see I, let's, my my head hurts let's, <laughs> let's well this is on. well this story that we're reading is Worm two seven three nine four nine two <laughs> We're going to have to read all of the different iterations oh eventually. We will never run out of episodes. It's true. So the PRT arrive, and the first guy says, holy shit, which I thought was pretty appropriate. Uh, they, they, they mean to spray containment foam all over the villains before loading them into the van, but Shadow Stalker argues against it. Um, she lies about Imp's power, which we still don't know. Yeah, so here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just write the new edition of the PRT handbook for everyone. All right. So on the first yeah. page, it's going to say always, 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 always use containment foam. Mm -hmm. And that's it. End of the book. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I can't really argue with you. I think that would be <laughs> sufficient, necessary and sufficient. Yep. Uh, yeah. So Regent's actually pretty good at thinking on his feet here because he makes up a pretty believable case for why Shadow Stalker would want to forego the containment foam along with an appeal to her authority. Yeah. And I do like this a lot because I think we've seen Regent's effectiveness in the past. Like he's he's been useful in the battles they've fought, but it feels like now he's like more confident and more in his element suddenly. Um, cause he, he does, he, he's really smart and he's really effective in these moments. Um, and, uh, that's, it, it's kind of exciting for him at, at, at this current moment before you start thinking of the implications of all this. Yeah. We're, we're, I think we're going to see when we get into his head a bit, um, that that's very true, actually, that it's, it's maybe the only thing that is exciting to him. Um, but anyway, the, the PRT officers just kind of pile the undersiders in the van like sacks of flour and then drive them to the HQ with Regent using the Shadow Stalker to keep an eye out on what's going on outside the van. Uh, inside the van, Taylor is worried but knows that Coyle is helping them with his power. So um, as the van arrives, the wards, uh, almost all of them, I think, come out to meet it. Uh, they're all suitably impressed by Shadow Stalker's accomplishment, although Weld is quiet. And here, Taylor doesn't recognize Weld's name, which indicates some poor mission prep. Yeah, I think, again, we'll get into this in a minute, but how how do you not know? <laughs> I just, like, we know they have spies on the inside, we know they have Telltale's power, and it's just like, it doesn't feel like they've thought this through very well. 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's that can be an open question. Like we've seen that we've seen the Telltale makes mistakes sometimes. Like, like when like when they did the bank robbery and she was like, yeah, we'll, we'll have two, maybe three heroes tops to deal with, and then it's like seven or whatever. Um, and and she like misses the one on the roof or whatever. So like it's it's it, it's been established that she can make mistakes, but it does seem like if you were going to take this risky of a of a plan, if you you know, even knowing you had Coil's power on your side, if you had actual intention of having it work, you would at least know what wards were going to be in the offices. Right, right. Know. Yeah. Uh, so for some reason, the line from Weld, keeping in mind that Regent is the highest rated master in the city, feels like as much of a reveal to me as seeing his power was in the first place. Like, I think I laughed out loud when he said that. Yeah, I, I really liked this, too, um, because you would never like, like I said last week, it, it when they said um, when they said that only one of the masters was of one concern, I think the natural indication for anyone reading a story where someone's a main character would assume they're just talking about the main character. Um, mm -hmm. But no, we were talking about Regent and it, it, it kind of does make me wonder why they haven't like gone after him more aggressively since he showed up in the city. And my guess is that. Uh, it, it's just mostly related to his decision to not use the body control aspect of his powers. Um, mm -hmm. He was staying under the radar um, and and not behaving in that way. So he was not listed as high of a priority. Yeah, that seems plausible to me. So thanks to Tattletail's power, uh, Regent knows the passwords meant to protect against this kind of mind control attack. Um, so Weld is, is smart and, and suspicious, but he didn't think about the Tattletale factor. Um, and plus, the PRT doesn't really understand Tattletale's power anyway, so he really can't possibly understand the Tattletale factor. Yeah, but fortunately for the wards, um, he's really smart. Yeah. And one question isn't enough to calm his suspicion of what's going on. Yes. Uh, with, with good reason, I think. That's right. I mean, he may even detect that she's not quite behaving correctly. We don't know. We don't see inside his head. But regardless, you're right. He doesn't let it go. He brings up the assault that Shadow Soccer has relatively recently. We don't really know the timetable that exactly, I think, but fairly recently perpetrated on Vista um, and the disciplinary cons consequences that are going to come from that. But he phrases it like Kid Wynn was the one that Shadow Soccer attacked. And once again, Regent does a good job for us detecting that it's a trap. But he fails when asked who Shadow Soccer actually attacked because there's really no way he'd know that. And then Weld knows it's a trap. Yeah, I, I love Weld's line here when he like for some reason it, it read in my head as like an exasperated where he's like, heads up, trap. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it probably was not meant to be that way. But in my head, that's what it was. But <laughs> I, you're right that like I, once again, we see Regent for half of a second, like be impressive and he detects this trap and then it quickly switches to this oh shit moment and yeah. this works because we were in Weld's head last arc um we understand the type of person he is we know he's smart we know he's calculated and he's careful um and it makes sense that he wouldn't that he wouldn't take the first password thing as as sufficient enough of uh, a reason why to let his guard down um I think if, if we hadn't been in Weld's head at this point, this would have felt more of a plot uh, contrivance that he got busted that, oh, we need them to get mm -hmm. caught now. So this one character is going to be weirdly untrusting. But mm -hmm. because we know him, that that beat lands mm -hmm. um, and it works really well. I love that moment. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, that's a, that's a great observation because we like we like all the wards and we like all the undersiders. Um, so we don't we actually are kind of happy for Weld that he caught on to this, even though we feel uh, anxious for our, for our, yeah. our protagonists who are the villains, of course. Um, there, there is a lot of uh, unsure of how to feel uh, yeah. throughout, throughout the rest of this fight. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, you're right. We'll see a lot of that coming up. So we move on in, into 10.3. Um, and when Flechette shows up, we realize that the Undersiders were unaware of both Weld and Flechette being present, which, again, seems like a pretty big oversight. Yeah, so here's here's where I think my main problem with uh, Arc 10 rears its ugly head. 
Um, so we can we take a minute and try to break down this this plan and why sure. it makes no sense at all. Okay. <laughs> so I guess the idea was to use Regent as Shadow Stalker in order to infiltrate the wards, to gain access to their computer system, to download some information and give it to Coil, um, thus cementing their partnership with Coil and uh, helping Taylor along in her goal of eventually trying to persuade him to give up Dinah. Um, so that's the plan, right? Um, as as we understand it. that I think that makes sense <laughs> okay. to me. Yeah. So I don't understand why they did it this way. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. um if if you can be shadow stalker from a distance why not just have her show up on her own walk in and sit down at her computer in her place uh download the information um if if like tattletale needs to be there to know how to properly hack and download like you can have her standing next to regent and relaying information or whatever um and like worst case if she's busted Regent just releases her and they deal with that later, but they're not in this huge, like almost die fight. Like, or, or, or considering a shadow stalker, if she's busted, she just phases out of. The yeah. 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 <laughs> like, I, like why, like why take the risk and like, and why does all of them need to be there too? Like the part of what made Weld so suspicious was that Shadow Stalker managed to catch every single member of the Undersiders all at once by herself. Why not catch one of them? Why not catch the one that we learn later um can make people forget that they noticed her? Like I just there's so many like the the, the this it just I, I can't wrap my head around why this made sense. Yeah, um, now I, I I don't know I'm not I'm not really invested in defending it because as as the action scenes in Worm go this one seemed to feel the least justified um um y- one could argue that maybe your description of the of the purpose of the plan wasn't um the actual purpose of the plan in in their minds but yeah. if that's the case then it wasn't conveyed to us like for example there could have been an, an ulterior ulterior motive of like embarrassing the wards again, but because it certainly would be embarrassing to have that's true. the undersiders break into their own den and steal their data and steal their weapons and blow up their gift shop. Um, but that wasn't, as far as I recall, that's not conveyed to us if that is the case. Um, e- even just knowing that, that could potentially change your interpretation of, of the events here. Um, yeah, so it, it's always it's always difficult in stories to, to manage like when you're going to reveal a piece of information so that um, the context and the expectation is set for the reader so that they're not asking the questions of like, well, why is this happening? This doesn't make sense because you can always explain like if you explain later, it doesn't erase the fact that they were confused the first time they encountered um, that that event. You yeah. Know. Uh, yeah, I know I'm being abstract here, but no, um, I, I think you have a good point. And, and I, I think I'm being probably overly critical on this. Um, my biggest thing, like. If 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 I think about it the other way around, if I think about it, if everything had worked perfectly, what would have the executed plan looked like? Mm-hmm. Because it, with the plan as it is designed right now, they're eventually going to have to fight because they're going to get arrested and they're going to need to break out before they're totally shut down. Um, I, I just like, so they would have gotten snuck in. Like when were they going to surprise, like break out? Was it going to be at that same moment anyway? So it didn't matter that uh, they, that weld like saw through their thing. Like, it's just, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know what the plan would have been. Um, and I think, because I'm set up with that, like I don't think the action scenes going forward work as well for me. Yeah. I I think that would have been useful to have some, maybe Taylor in her internal thinking specify more for us what the desired exact outcome actually was so that we know how this deviated from that. I think that's fair. Yeah. And if you, if you contrast it with like, um, the fundraiser attack that they did where they jump in and there's this real moment of 
oh shit, like what is their plan here? Like how are they going to get out of this? This seems stupid. And then you see the plan unfold and execute and you're like, oh, that was actually pretty clever. And yeah, some things happened that they weren't expecting and things got worse than they were thinking they would. But they still had a, a decent plan and, and were able to get out. This just feels like just a, a clusterfuck of confusion that they just happened to escape from at the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could go on and on, but yeah, I mean, that's like, that's just my general thoughts on, on as I was trying to parse through this. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, I guess we, we can go through it and, and maybe we'll, we'll find some things that are, uh, uh redeeming. Um, so basically, as the fight progresses, Regent is capitalizing on Shadow Stalker's inherent power, plus the ward's reluctance to hurt her to make himself a major nuisance. Yeah, she also stabs Weld in the fucking eye with a, a crossbow bolt. Yeah, yeah. Which is funny. It's cool. It's funny to me because I don't think any of the Undersiders ever realizes that Weld sticks to anything metal. Um but yeah. th- th- they nonetheless managed to use this against him. It's actually a huge disadvantage once your opponents realize that because they right. just like throw metal at you. Yeah. Um, so and then D- Taylor hears cackling like someone having way too much fun, followed by flechettes. They've got someone someone with a stranger classification. Um, so, Scott, I don't think um, you could actually pack any more big fun reveals into an arc like th- that's. That's why that's why I can't help but love this arc, even though we just kind of nitpick this this battle quite a bit. Is like we we got the regent reveal, and then we've actually been holding what a stranger is to you know to the chest for this whole time, and now we're finally getting a sense of what a stranger is. But it's it's in this really cool way where it's like, okay, someone okay, imp is a stranger, but what's happening? What she, no one's <laughs> noticing her and it's so you're piecing all this together as the fight's going on and it's infl- it's it's telling you what a stranger is yeah I, I like as again as much as i was ragging on this whole thing i like this a lot um I, i'm guessing that stranger is defined as something to do with stealth or not being noticed because that fits into to what is imp, imp is doing um and Amp's particular version of this power is literally just screwing with people's heads. And, and I like that a lot. Um, and I like the detail of that. It's not like targetable. It's like an area of effect thing. Like it hits Taylor as much as it hits everyone else. Um, and so like, it's hard to strategize around her if you keep forgetting that she's there. Um, mm-hmm. And I like how Taylor like comments and it might not be in this moment here, but she comments in this battle that that kind of screws with the synergy of the group. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, I appreciate that, um, because I think she's right that they worked well together and this kind of throws a wrench into not that she's not useful because she's extremely useful in this fight, but, um, it is a different thing that they are not used to dealing with. Right. It's, it definitely repeatedly trips up Taylor as, as she's just, she just lost several times during this fight and, and, and it yeah. pans out because so is everyone else, including the opponents and Imp capitalizes on it. But Imp is actually not experienced either. So yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's very unusual. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, as much as we just kind of ragged on things here, um, I, I still enjoy a, a lot of the details of, of how this plays out. Yeah. Well, and that's, and that's, <laughs> I think that's the eternal struggle in my mind when I was thinking about even nitpicking into the details of this, because it, it makes it seem like I didn't like this arc or I didn't like this battle. And I don't think those are true things. I think that I had problems with it, but mm-hmm. I love imp. I love imp's fire axe <laughs> for some mm-hmm. reason. I, I don't know why she has an axe that's on fire, but I love it. Um, I, I like a lot of how this plays out. I love a lot of the interactions that we see. Um, I like how this fight between these two sides after being in the head of both of them is more emotionally impacting. I like it all. Um, but yeah, yeah um yeah uh, uh, yeah we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to what i was going to say in a second but uh f- at this moment taylor brings out her special bugs and attacks vista kidwin and flechette as well as two prt uniforms that are holding her um and then scott i'm sure you're happy about this kid wins screams unintelligibly it burns because taylor's bugs are covered in capsaicin no matt i like kidwin now remember 
No, just kidding. I laughed a lot. <laughs> I laughed a lot. I mean, it's funny because we do like it when we also. <laughs> It, it's okay to it's okay to i will him. still make fun of him for the rest of the book as long as he's yeah. in it i will continue to make fun of him but yes i understand him more um no but that's like how fucked up of taylor right <laughs> like i love how it started like i was trying to make my bugs immune to pepper spray and instead i just made them these mobile pain delivery systems mm-hmm. and it, like yeah. literally only taylor would go you know what's not efficient enough? A hornet sting. Let me yeah. let me make it worse. <laughs> yeah, it's not quick enough. And it doesn't <laughs> spread across. Yeah. I mean, it's really it's really brilliant and it's it's classic Taylor, but it's just it made me laugh so much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Gru, who's being somewhat effective up to this point, is pinned in place by Flechette, and then Clockblocker lunges for him. And even though he uses his darkness, Clockblocker just knows that he hasn't moved because he's pinned in place, and he manages to tag him. So now Gru is out of the fight for up to 10 minutes. Yeah, this was surprisingly emotionally impactful for me because I don't think we had seen Clockblocker tag someone that was on our side. Like, mm-hmm. we, he, he tagged Leviathan, which was amazing. And uh, we saw him get tagged by himself and we've seen him use the paper. But like to just suddenly like the guy that helps us escape is now out of the fight. Um, it was like, oh, shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Like that's th- this. This felt very dire at a few points. Like you, you were like, man, have they really have they finally pushed it too far? Yeah, because it's a, keep... bad, it's a bad plan, Matt. It's a bad plan. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, maybe it was supposed to be a bad plan. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we're being shown how disorganized and not, like, working together they are here. Certainly possible. Yeah. So Flechette uses her darts to pierce all of the containment foam canisters in sight, which causes a growing hazard of foam on all sides. It's my girl. Knows how to use the foam. Read my That's PTR right. book. Uh, Regent tries to stop her, but his power backfires and the lapse of in concentration lets Shadow Soccer have a bit of freedom. And she takes that opportunity to scream and shoot at Regent and then beg Weld for help before she succumbs to his power again. Um, and Regent goes out of his way to verify out loud that Shadow Soccer has been conscious in there for a while. So I'm not going to lie. When we first saw this power in action, when it was first revealed that Regent was t- had taken control of Shadow Sucker, my initial reaction was, "Oh, that's really cool." Um, and then, like, you don't think you don't think about the cost of that, and then it, in the middle of this battle, suddenly the cost of that is revealed, and it's horrifying. Um, and, and like, up until this point, like as much as I had issues with the 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 setup around this battle i was kind of enjoying it from the perspective of an observer because i like liked both sides of these fight i would rather they just like put down their weapons and be friends um mm-hmm. but at, at this moment i'm just like okay i'm on the ward side now <laughs> it's wards take this guy out do something to him um and, and it's just like it's incredible how like quickly that switch flipped with me and i was like oh dear god this is this is terrible Interesting. And and I appreciate that Taylor was as uncomfortable with it in this moment as I was, seemingly. But, you know, not enough to, like, stop using it to her advantage. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I was probably more along the just, like, this is just, like, delightfully horrifying. Like, not that it's not horrifying, but that I'm just enjoying like the horror aspect of it. I don't know if that it's hard, it's hard to explain <laughs> what that feels like from the inside, but it's like the same reason people enjoy horror as a genre. You know, people genuinely enjoy horror as a genre. They're not like, Oh, this is terrible. This is just terrible. Yeah. Let me I, buy another Stephen King book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I want to make a distinction here. And I think we'll get into this in Alex chapter a little more that um, me being horrified by this moment doesn't mean that I didn't like it. Mm-hmm, and, right. and, and I like it a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I had a very visceral, emotional reaction to it. Um, and, and I love horror, so I love feeling this way, but, um, yeah, it, it, it got to me. Um, I I think just like when she goes to weld a person that we know she doesn't like, and it's just like, help me. It's just Mm -hmm. like, holy shit. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's what we're supposed to be feeling. Uh, the dogs finally 
arrive because they had they had basically run off um, when the undersiders were fake attacked, and now they smash back in, and so now the dogs are here to keep Weld in check, um, which is useful because the undersiders don't really have an answer to somebody like Weld, who's like practically invulnerable and super strong. Uh, it's funny to note that. Taylor is actually still handcuffed at this point. I don't know if that's like explicitly pointed out prior to this, but it doesn't matter because she's contributed to the battle almost more than anybody. She's taken out three wards. It helps when you have your terrible pain bugs that you can just (laughs) send out. (laughs) Right. I think it's just fun that she has a power where she's literally handcuffed and being held in place by two guys. And she's just like barely aware of that. She's just prosecuting the battle. Yes. So so much. So, so much not aware of it that you're right. I didn't realize until someone takes her handcuffs off that she's handcuffed. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Like cause that just didn't occur to me at all. But yeah, like she doesn't, that's, that's not a hindrance for her at all. Yeah. So at this point, kid Wayne activates his new floating modular gun turret thing that, that he was um, developing previously. I'm so, I'm so proud of him. He did it. Good job, yeah. buddy. I know. Isn't it great? Because because you were like, you you wanted him to have a success and yeah, and feel good about something, especially in his tinker stuff, because he felt so down about taking apart his hoverboard and not being able to finish any project. So it's yeah. just so heartwarming. And I think this was set up. Um, I think in Vista's chapter, um, we saw like, and he was in the background, like writing something out and planning. And then Vista got back from a conversation with Weld. Um, he was already building it. So like mm-hmm. there's this setup that whatever whatever amount of confidence or catharsis he reached during his chapter, um, he's been able to to get over his limitations, at least temporarily. And you see it in practice here. And it's this cool little idea that he had that now we get to see in action. Yeah, totally. And, and it's pretty cool, too, because it like shoots the orbs that then like return to him and, and float around him and like make yeah. a shield around him. And it actually takes him from being like kind of a not very useful hero like we saw in in the fight with with the travelers to being fairly formidable here um you know he hasn't had a lot of time to kind of think through how to use this Mm -hmm. and 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 it it gets he gets knocked down by the dogs um pretty quickly here um but uh but it's you know it's still a pretty effective uh power that that he whips up but i do like the beat of where um, Taylor yells at, at Shadow Stalker to tell Regent to to charge her into him, and uh-huh. he, he replies, "I can't. It would mess up with my connection to her." And you see Kidwin like hear that and like immediately try to shoot a lightning bolt at Shadow Stalker, and yeah. it's like Kidwin, look at you go. Yeah, proud of you. Yeah, he he is smart. Yeah. So after Taylor orders the dogs to do something, she says, "Good boy," um, and then gets promptly body slammed by Rachel for daring to either order or praise the dogs. Yes. Yeah, so I just want to remind everyone that I said they would become friends, <laughs> not stay friends. <laughs> and you were right, Scott. You uh, were right. <laughs> also, I really love Bentley, the bulldog. I, I, I don't even like bulldogs, but now I want a bulldog named Bentley. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so at this point, Tattletail, Imp, and Regent, uh, and Taylor go deeper into the building leaving Rachel and her dogs and Shadow Soccer to defend Gru, who is still frozen in time. Telltale has some flash drives, and she begins hacking into the mainframe firewall Unix system gigabytes. I feel like you just made some of those words up, Matt. What? Huh? Um, and then Dragon cuts the power to everything, I think, which I guess interrupts the download, but I think they already finished it more or less, and she shows her face in a monitor. Hey Matt, have I mentioned how dumb this plan is? Because this plan's pretty dumb. It's pretty dumb. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see, Scott. <laughs> Won't we? So ten point four opens. Regent and Imp are trying to hack their way out of the room they're in with with the axe while Tattletail verbally spars with Dragon. Tattletail uh, sorry, Taylor tries to she tries to figure out some of the tinker tinker equipment that's lying around. Um and eventually Taylor finds a gun that is capable of knocking down the door. I just really appreciate the irony of the undersiders using Kidwin's old weapons like to better effect than he ever did. <laughs> I really like that. That's funny. Um, so they head, once they've knocked down the door, they head back upstairs 
and they run into a huge group of PRT officers. For some reason, I imagine this as being like when Han turns the corner in the Death Star and there's like 10,000 stormtroopers um, because that's kind of how Taylor reacts. Uh, but Imp apparently, while this is happening, just walks up to them, steals a grenade launcher from them and uses a concussion grenade to knock them all out. So then they're uh, just as effective as, as stormtroopers. As uh, well, yes. Yes. Don't get mad at me, PRT fans, please. <laughs> <laughs> is this a joke? I feel like yeah. people are very defensive of the PRT. You don't want to antagonize the PRT block, Scott. They're a very powerful <laughs> block. Um, so back with Gru, Weld has taken out the dogs and cornered Rachel and um, and Shadowstalker. Um, Imp, Taylor, and Tattletail use their stolen guns on Weld, but he largely shrugs off the attacks and knocks Imp aside. Um, Regent ultimately throws Shadow Soccer's body under Weld's 600-pound frame and causes him to finally fall just to avoid crushing her. Um, yeah. Yeah, I liked the detail here, like when Regent um, like got hurt by throwing Shadow Stalker here. Um, mm -hmm. Taylor guesses was this like a backfire, but she doesn't seem sure. So it, it feels like maybe this was just Shadow Stalker like really fighting back in this moment. Um, and that hurt him. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my interpretation based on what we know later is is that maybe he, he maybe it hurts him as much as it hurts Shadow Soccer like, yeah. to be stepped on. That's possible, um, too. Yeah. So um, I also like when they hit Weld on the face with guns. Yeah. And I like the Taylor's just like, huh, he didn't seem this hot. I wonder why this this gun is sticking to him. Yeah. So she doesn't fully get it, but she uses it anyway. Yeah. And I always think it's funny how well reacts in these situations when stuff gets stuck to him he's always just like oh man yeah he's so annoyed yeah, yeah. i love it yeah um and then dragon arrives in a dragon yeah um and it, it was again in this moment that i forgot which side i was supposed to be cheering for <laughs> because watching weld laugh as this like really well described dragon machine lands in front of the battle seeming like it like instantly turns the tide just felt like a victory shot moment and mm -hmm. i was almost like yes i was like wait a minute wait a minute no <laughs> no this is bad yeah i mean i think we could talk for a very long time about the narrative function of having the whole wards interlude happen and then having the first thing that happens when we come back to taylor be her attacking the wards yeah especially with the moral grayness of their method of of infiltration being uh this uh terrible abuse of of sophia yeah as as dragon will say much later in this arc it's like yep she's really a committed villain now and even though in, in taylor's head she's like no no it's all for a good cause right it's like yeah you're really starting to look like a committed villain there taylor um so yeah we open 10.5 and dragon is wading into the battle spraying containment foam everywhere uh, Taylor is being fairly resourceful as usual. She's intercepting some of the foam with shards of glass that are picked up by her bugs and then kind of like positioning those in, in advantageous places to try to block or, or blind um, Dragon. Dragon read my book too, Matt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, do we... Never mind, I'm not going to ask that. I, I do like uh, Taylor's little beat about how she says she's been researching her bugs so she like knows how much they're capable of lifting mm -hmm. um and and so she she literally makes a glass shield by having her bugs pick up glass and it's really cool i like yeah. it a lot yeah this is another thing that's i immediately tried to visualize in detail what this would look like with this dragon mecha suit spraying stuff and and bugs putting a shield of glass in the air um, Tattletail points out that the suit packs too many lethal weapons, which she views as a disadvantage for Dragon, because much like in the previous Traveler's fight, she can't really use a lot of what she has. And Regent asserts that there is somebody in the suit, uh, though Tattletail thinks it must be unmanned. It's probably not some sort of like monster fetus or anything. No, I don't know why you would say that, Scott. Um, so Dragon gives Weld a reprieve. Uh, by creating a, t a containment foam wall between him and and Shadow Soccer and the dogs, uh, the dog rather, um, and then the Undersiders flee into the gift shop, which is another delightful image to me. 
Yeah, I like I, and again, as much as I have qualms with this plan and battle, um, I love this setting. Like we haven't talked about the settings of fights too often, but mm-hmm. I, I think Wild Bill does a very good job of uh, geographically defining what the setting looks like. And I think this gift shop is part of that. It's like it feels very real. Um, and, and I have a very clear image of what this PRT office looks like. And just adding a little gift shop into it is just icing on the cake as far as that image in my head. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many little details that, that I'm, I'm not going to call out as they happen. But just like at some point, Tattletales throw, throws a Miss Militia bust at Dragon. <laughs> and it's like, that's 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 totally what would be there and that's so hilarious to to envision for some right, reason right yeah um it turns out that dragon seems to be able to see imp um and she's able to direct weld's movements to fight her even though he can't track her yeah I, i'm wondering um if this is supposed to be like a, her sensors can't be confused by the power thing or a subtle hint that dragon isn't human um and it could be both I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I don't know if we I don't know if we're really given a, a, a clear answer on that even once we find out that she's not human because we don't really understand exactly how Imp's power works. Yeah. So Dragon um also happens to have some kind of spray that liquefies the containment foam so that keeps her from being stuck in her own foam. Um so she pr- fairly easily frees herself from Paler's attempts at sticking her with her own goo via the bugs. But then finally, Gru's darkness comes in to the rescue. <laughs> and I just love his. He's like, well, what's going on? Dragons here. <laughs> Can you imagine like just being frozen out of a battle for 10 minutes and you yeah. get back and this is what's happening? Right. I, I love mean, it. Yeah. Yeah. From his point of view, the battle had been going on for like a minute and then he comes to and everything is destroyed and there's foam everywhere and there's <laughs> dragon. Yeah. I do uh, just want to point out that if the person that makes foam also has a foam removal spray, then the only negative part of the foam is effectively nullified and everyone should just be using foam and the foam is broken and powerful. And I'm going to get like a thousand comments this week explaining why I'm wrong about the foam, but I'm just going to trap all those comment people in foam and uh, you're all going to be foamed. Foam, foam is broken. Hashtag foamed. Yeah. Well, I think probably the, the, the rebuttal to, to your, uh, foam antagonist position that, that i find most convincing is that you have to have like a giant 100 pound backpack to to use it and dragon here is in the giant mech or yeah she's she is in it um even though she's a machine <laughs> um and and so it's pl- it's more plausible that she would have that capability rather than just like some random person having the backpack but I'm gonna let that go for now scott just hashtag foamed i guess i didn't let it go i guess i went you, you on did exactly the opposite lengthy, of that yeah, but I'm going to <laughs> characterize that as letting it go so that it seems like I'm taking the high ground here. But he, here's what I'm not going to do. Uh-huh. I'm not going to let it go. And I'm, <laughs> I'm going to call it out every single time. All right. Well. OK, good. <laughs> Very well, move on. So Tattletail uses a lightning gun to melt away the bars protecting the windows. I guess we didn't mention that she got a lightning gun, but she got a lightning gun at some point back when back when they were stealing kid wind stuff. Um, and then she jams the trigger down and throws the gun toward Dragon. Yeah, and this is when she, uh, she uses the Miss Militia uh, mannequin to hold mm-hmm. the trigger down and throws yeah. it at Dragon. Um, poor kid Wynn, his gun is being really helpful to the people he's fighting against. Yeah, yeah. So Taylor tries some shenanigans involving um, the electrified exterior of Dragon's suit and the lightning gun. I have a hard time following what she was intending to do here, um, so I'm can't really summarize it but the consequence is that she ends up like really close to dragon physically yeah it was really unclear to me as well and i think maybe it's just because we don't get to see the end part of her plan um Mm -hmm. but i'm still really confused like i guess was she gonna like run up dragon to get to the window i i I don't understand yeah i'm I'm just gonna move on from there because I spent a bit of time trying to summarize it, and I was like, I just, uh, I, I don't know. But it's not that important. What's important is that she's really close to Dragon, and then she gets knocked over by something right into a pool of containment foam. And then she realizes that it was Rachel and one of her dogs that knocked her over, and then Rachel escapes. What a bitch. See what I did there? Because that's her name. It's 
good. We've been holding that in for 10 hours. <laughs> so some of, uh, at this point, some of a dragon solvent gets on Taylor's encasement. Um, and then dragon kind of realizes that actually Tattletail's plan with the lightning gun was that it would overload and explode. Uh, and dragon realizes this. So she wraps her suit around the explosion. Um, and by the time she's done talking to Taylor, um, Taylor's um, goo is melted, so she's able to escape. For some reason, I love this, like the 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 coldness, which is like sort of hidden, but not really hidden in this line of hers. Count yourself fortunate, Skitter. I've never killed a criminal without explicit permission and all the filed paperwork. And I'm not about to start with you. I'll be in contact. Um, it's uh, it's uh, it's not reassuring that that's how she thinks about killing no it's not and the thing i like about it is how this plays out was so confusing to me at the time and i was all ready to be negative about it but then the the interlude fills in kind of all the blanks here or, or mostly um about why she was that kind of cold um and mechanical when she mm-hmm. talked like that and and maybe her motivation behind doing it is not fully clear, but at least partially clear. I, I really like how this sets up um, what we see in that bonus interlude. Yeah, totally. Um, so once the suit melts down and implodes and explodes, um, we see that there's kind of a fetus thing inside it. Yeah, this was really shocking to me. Um, because the thing like they specifically say the thing like mules at her. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, we don't know what this is, where it came from. Um, it seems like it might feel pain, but, um, I mean, the, the obvious answer is that their organics grown necessary because they're necessary to make the suit function. Um, is it part of dragon at this point? We don't know if she's a, we don't know that she's a, a, a AI herself. So is she like, my thought was like, is she like cloning herself? And using those clones to control the suit. And like, there's so many different things. It was, it was really a a mind fuck for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's interesting. I mean, while we're being a little bit uh, suspicious of dragon here, um, that she would, that she would like uh, inhabit her, her armored suits with something that appears capable of suffering. Like, if if it's kind of a humanoid looking thing that mules at Taylor as it as it dies, Dragon put that in there knowing that there was a good chance that it would die. Right. And didn't seem to care too much about it. So I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it does say a lot. Um and none of it is good. Yeah. Okay. Uh so Taylor escapes. Uh moving on to ten point six. Outside, um, pretty much the whole protectorate is there. Miss Militia, Assault, Battery um, are taking on the Undersiders. Taylor makes to confront Rachel at this point, but Telltale stops her because this isn't the time. Uh, Miss Militia is using smoke grenades to confuse the bugs, but it doesn't really work because Taylor kind of just overrides their instincts. But then she shoots Skitter with a shotgun, probably with non-lethal ammunition, um, but it's pretty much just as painful because of the silk costume. So does this feel weird to you? Um, because like throughout the thing we're talking about, we have to get away quick because the protector, uh, the protector, the protectorate. I don't know why I can't say that word today. Um, mm-hmm. Are about to show up and then they're screwed. Like once the protectorate gets there, it's game over. Um, yeah. And then they do show up and it's kind of just treated as minor. And I know like they specifically say that. Um, Miss Militia's team is so shorthanded that, like, if they had more people, they might have been able to fight back against them more effectively. But it just feels like kind of an afterthought. Like, this is the main superhero team, and they're just kind of fighting in the background, and then they escape, and then it's done, and it mm-hmm. seems easy. It just, it okay. felt weird to me. Yeah, I think that's that's a valid feeling. I think, um, I don't know if I shared that. I think my sense, if I had to think about it, is that they're outside now and that puts the ball very much in the undersiders court because of Gru's power where, where they can just do exactly what they do here, which is basically just put darkness everywhere and then just slip away. Whereas if they were in the building still, um, Gru's power has much less of an advantage because 
Gru Gru is a soft target actually if you if you know where he's going to be and if you and if you're in a hallway you kind of know roughly where he's going to be and that's how mm -hmm. that that is indeed how uh, Clock Blocker gets him. So I think the the difference is if the if the protector had showed up when they were still in the building they would have been in much more trouble. But since they're outside, I guess they're in they're in a lot less trouble, and that's. I think I don't think it felt weird to me, but I totally get uh, what you're saying there. I think that's fair, and I think the reason why maybe I was thinking it as as much more of a they were in an actual fight with each other, and mm -hmm. then the undersiders just went and escaped. But it's probably more realistic that they were literally just buying time for a few seconds, and and in a in a full you know knockdown drag out fight, they yeah. would have maybe lost. But in just the ability to buy time and then run away that's like what they do so yeah yeah i'm yeah. okay with that yeah yeah i mean because i think you're right that like just assault and battery are are pretty strong and really the, the undersiders just want to escape so yeah that's that's what happens um so when rachel so so yeah so uh so telltale and taylor basically just hunker down while grew uses his darkness to blind everyone and then retrieves the other teammates from the darkness. And then when they finally, when he brings Rachel to their hiding spot, Skitter pulls a reverse first time they met, striking her with her combat baton and backhanding her and then tackling her on the ground and putting the baton between her teeth and pulling her head back, um, which is all very violent and, and visceral. I'm not sure if she's overtly doing the dominant psychology thing here, uh, but regardless, I think that the effect, um, I think that's the effect that it that it has. Um, she specifically verbalizes, re remember that you were the weak one, which is pretty much exactly the type of thing that that you would expect her to say if she were doing the dog psychology manipulation. Uh, and then she follows it up by offering to be her friend regardless. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. And the weird. So I, I was thinking about this because I saw this as a really great moment of growth for Taylor. Um, and that, that line of thinking got me thinking about how I, I used to be much more concerned for Taylor than I am right now. And I probably should be more concerned for Taylor because I still think she's heading down a dangerous path. Um, but in this particular moment, I didn't see her violence as being needless. I saw, thought her seem being explicitly violent because that's how she knows she's going to get to, to Rachel. Um, and then the 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 turn when she said i'm gonna be your friend i'm gonna help you with the dogs if you want it it's not because i need you to be my friend it's because i recognize that you need something and you need help with something and you're going through something and i want to help you um and i love that moment i love it's a real moment of leadership in her um it, it's and and i love how she like she swallows her pride and does that necessary thing um and i really love her in this moment i really do Mm -hmm. I also like how the undersiders react to this, uh, where it's obvious that at this point they take Taylor seriously. Yeah. And, and, and she has come into a level of confidence that we haven't seen to her in, in her prior to this, where she's not, there's, there's none of this like self doubting self talk where she's worried about how this is going to be taken. She's just, it's, it's very like you, like you say, it, she knows exactly what she's doing. She's, she's being calculated about this. She, she essentially orders the others to stand back while she does this. Um, and then, and then acts like it was no big deal when it's over and it almost is no big deal to her. And it's just, yeah, in, in terms of growth, it's growth in, in the villain direction, I would say, but it is, Definitely yeah, gross. yeah, yeah, and and you're absolutely right because I think if you look at just the narration between, let's say, arc one and this one, you, you're mm -hmm. absolutely right that the level of internalizing and doubt and questioning in her actions that we see in her head has drastically decreased. She's mm -hmm. not doing that as much anymore. We don't hear her. Uh, we don't hear her reason through stuff in her head as much. We just kind of see her act. And we mm -hmm. still, we still, I mean, we're still in her point of view. We still hear her thoughts. We still do all that stuff. But yeah, there's, there's very little doubt there. There's very little uh, wondering. Um, it's just, I'm doing this and this yeah. is why I'm doing this. Right. A lot more self-certainty, which ties into what you were saying about being able to justify things 
um, she's justifying more and more quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So after they handle this altercation, they discuss what to do with Shadowstalker. Imp suggests that they keep her, which is uh, a little bit of characterization <laughs> for Imp, I guess. A little, a little bit, yeah. Um, Regent, and but it's actually Regent, I think it kind of surprises us a little bit that Regent says no, um, but his objections are all practical um, rather than like moral. Um, and he, he agrees they should let her go because he's such a great guy. Yeah, he's such a, such a kind soul. Yeah, right. As we've as we've seen. Um, and the, then he also admits that he previously when he was hijacked, he kept three people that he used regularly with his sister's help. OK, yeah, that's not great. No, that's but he admitted it, Scott. You know, he's, he's trying to the first step to. To fixing your problem. <laughs> OK, so, um, so so he lets Shadow Soccer go. Yay. He lets her go, um, but he lets her know that he can easily take control again uh, now that he's figured out her nervous system, and then he uh, he walks her out. Yeah, that's not that's not great either. Yeah. Um, so they go to meet Coil in a re- reinforced quadruplex, and they give Coil the stolen data. And his first request regarding the data is to extract information about the Slaughterhouse Nine. We get confirmation that some of them have indeed been seen seen in town. And we get a little bit of a rundown on the, sh- on the nine um, at this point, which I think is literally the first information we really get as to them as individuals. Uh, so Bonesaw is a preteen girl, wide-eyed, sprayed with dried blood. Shatterbird, dark complexion woman with a bird-themed costume, and she opens with she always o- opens up the the festivities with a some kind of wide scale terror attack, although we don't really understand what that is, I think. Yeah, I really like the the touch here where uh, Taylor, after seeing what sh- her costume looks like, says it reminds her of the bird themed uh, KP she couldn't save during mm-hmm. the Leviathan attack. I really like that touch. Um, yeah. I like it because it gives us kind of a clear image of what this l- looks like. I like it because it's kind of showing that Taylor still feels a little guilty about that or a little sad that she wasn't able to save this person or, or that she did save them. And then they, they ended up not making it anyway. I, just, right. I really like that. Yeah. It's still on her mind. Yeah. yeah. Uh, fine. Uh, next we have, we see crawler, which we only see as a misshapen silhouette on a security camera mannequin who seems to have an artificial body, a tinker with a body modification fetish. His joints are a mix of chains and ball joints. The Siberian, a naked woman with black and white stripes who doesn't talk and is strong enough to walk away from encounters with the entire triumvirate. Uh, Burns. Yeah, right. It's, it's like, okay, we're, we're calibrating the power levels here. Burn scar, a, a teenage slash early twenties girl with glowing eyes and cigarette burns on her cheeks and hatchet hatchet face who just seems to have kind of a mushed up face. And finally Jack slash Johnny Depp with a jagged beard and a small kitchen knife. So, I mean, we're just calling this guy got Johnny Depp from now on, right? Yeah. I mean, I tempted to do my fan art of just drawing Johnny Depp <laughs> and then drawing a, this beard on him. Um, uh, yeah, so Scott, do you do you see any connections between these uh, descriptions and the three bodies that the wards found? Yeah, it's funny that didn't even occur to me until I was on my second read through. But yeah, I think that the mannequin and burn scar bodies are very clear. Um, the the other one was flayed, I think. Yeah, um, flayed. Yeah. I I don't. I mean, I guess I'm guessing Johnny Depp, but I don't. I'm not quite sure on that. But yeah, I mean, I think we understand that their thing is each of them kills someone in a very specific kind of way that relates to their powers. And these guys are terrifying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, they have the, the like next level psychopathy where they actually enjoy these types of horrific things. Yeah. And I like how Taylor explains it, right? She says like, there's some people that became bad after they got powers. Um, and then there's some people that were just monsters and then got powers. Yeah. And, and that's who the slaughterhouse nine are. Yeah. Yeah. So at this point, um, Dinah is there and she mentions when she's being asked some of her probability questions, she mentions that Jack slash is the one who makes everyone die. 
And her explanation is uh, sometimes it's in two years, sometimes it's in eight, sometimes in between. But if he's alive, something happens and everyone on Earth starts to die. Not that everyone doesn't die anyways, but they die really fast uh, when that something happens, all one after another. And in a year, almost everyone is dead. So I said everyone, if that makes sense. And a few lives, uh, a few live, but they die pretty soon after anyways. And so basically, it's... It's, it seems rambling, but there's a lot of information in here that mm-hmm. that that like it's either two or eight years, and then and then then there are other cases, and and it all but like various things seem to hinge a lot on on Jack Slash and and, and something about him. Um, but everyone is confused about this because his power doesn't seem that dangerous, really. He basically just extends the cutting edge of blades that he's holding. And as far as far as everyone, as far as anyone knows, that's all he can do powers wise. Um, Dinah clarifies that everyone still dies, even if somebody assassinates Jack just much later. Um, millions or billions always die is her final you know, statement on this. Yeah, and we're kind of diving into the horror genre again, aren't we? Um, <laughs> this is this is really terrifying. Um, and we're doing a lot of setup here, and I think it's very clear that the Slaughterhouse Nine are going to be the uh, big bads, for lack of a better term, for the foreseeable future in this in this story. Um, and and I really I like this. I like how we we've talked about escalation as one of the themes, and mm-hmm. we've escalated from giant uh, beast destroying city to eight like street level humans who are just crazy but we found a way to escalate these friday the 13th type characters into a world ending type situation and i think that's very interesting and clever because i think the stakes will be high but the conflict could be uh more personal and i think that's a very interesting way of doing things and escalating conflict and and i'm very interested to see where this goes yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we got that little bit of taste of, of horror when we saw the mutilated bodies last arc. Right. And, and as we're introduced to these guys, it's like, yep, these are these are characters from from a horror genre thing. And, and we're, we are beginning to shift in that direction. I yeah. think um, I think it's I think it's safe to say. Um, and, and of course, introducing this this element of, um, you know, billions of people dying essentially at the end of the world. Uh, being contingent on on this situation i think this really highlights what you were saying about this basically being the first arc of book two um Mm -hmm. because this is introducing first of all it's introducing the the antagonists that we're going to be facing and it's introducing um the stakes right for the arc i would say exactly yeah yeah um and just so that we know you know personal stakes Dinah says there's a 60% chance that the undersiders will encounter them at some point and the 50% chance that they will die if they fight them. That's crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Right. So coil, they basically, they just like, okay, I can't really deal with this right now. So we're just going to do what we were doing anyway. And we'll look into that. Uh, Coil assigns their territories to the, to the undersiders. Rachel gets some assistance, including, I think, including two pair humans. I wasn't hundred percent sure on that. Um, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tattletail is set up in an old ABB location with some mercs, and Skitter is given the south end of the old boardwalk. The rest, he kind of leaves to figure out what they need uh, with, uh, to uh, administer their territories. Yeah, I, I really like this idea of the minute we get the band back together, uh, well, both splits them up again. Mm-hmm. And it, I think it's a really good way of showing that while they're a team again, um, things are not good amongst them. They are in very different places, both uh, literally and within their relationships with each other. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's a really, really good way of showing that, that the events of this arc did not really bring them any closer together. Yeah, that's that's correct. That, and, and it is a little bit sad, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, Skidder stays behind to talk to the coil and it seems... It, it, it seems this way. It, it isn't said explicitly, but it seems like she's now using her swarm voice almost exclusively when she's in costume. Which yeah, is, which goes which to awesome. her, her terror factor again. Yes. Uh, so she makes her proposal to Coil that he let Dinah go after he's won, 
and he basically just refuses her. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, it's, it's tough to see what her full plan was at this point, right? Um, I don't think her whole plan was, I'm just going to make him happy, and then I'm going to ask him to do it, and then he's going to say yes. Um, obviously, <laughs> that is not realistic. She has to know on some level that that was never going to happen. Um, and I, I really do love this moment of strength from her at the end of this chapter where um, she says, I took a deep breath to calm my nerves. I could do this. Whatever I had to do, I was going to help that girl. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that's both inspiring in, in the level of strength she's found and also kind of scary, like you said, because when she has a clear goal like this in mind, she's willing to look the other way on a lot of her actions in order to, to, to accomplish that goal. Mm -hmm. Um and, and, and along with that, doesn't it seem like she's kind of holding up, like saving Dinah as like the thing that's going to solve all her problems? Like if uh -huh. she if she could just save this kid, then like everything she has done up until this point will be have been worth it. It will be OK. Um, it, it'll it'll make her guilt uh, go away. Um, and, and and like, doesn't it seem like that? Like she's holding this up as the solution. Um, save this kid. Everything's good. Yeah, um, I, I think her guilt about this is so overwhelming that it's distorting her thinking about the other things that she's mm -hmm. having to do. Because um, she's she's volunteered to serve Coyle in a way where the negative consequences of that are fairly open-ended, potentially. But she's doing it for the sake of righting this wrong that she feels she did. So... You know, obviously she's going to try to keep the books balanced in her own head in some way, yeah. but uh, we don't necessarily trust that she's doing it um, correctly. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's a very fair uh, assumption. Um, I'm pretty sure that she's not. Yeah. I mean, she has not demonstrated a strong ability to do this in the past. So. No, not at all. Yeah. Yeah, so we... We end on like you like you pointed out that moment of strength with her, that moment of commitment, uh, and we move on into the horror genre of, <laughs> of Regent's interlude, which is one of my favorite chapters. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll second that. Um, so we see from inside Regent's head that he didn't let Shadow Soccer go at all at, at any point. It was all theater, even when she seemed to be free for a moment. Um, uh, he knew she was too furious to do anything other than kill them all. And we see from his point of view that he can sense her emotions, which isn't necessarily something we knew when we were um, in Taylor's head. Right. And I think I think it's probably a good idea for us to hold off on debating the moral impl implications of all this, um, mm -hmm. because I think from what I understand, it's pretty hotly contested uh, in the warm community in general. Um, and we might have some differing opinions on this, but I just here wanted to point out that I'm letting you go. Regent lied is like the perfect way to set the tone for this chapter. Um, yeah. it, first of all, it's echoing a line we heard earlier, but in completely different context. And it just sets the standard for the disturbing nature of everything that's about to happen from here on out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to highlight this line where Regent thinks Regent knew he was a background character for the most part. He played along. He didn't make waves. He didn't stand out. He wasn't close to any of the others. And uh, I mean, it, it's I think it's fantastically bold for a, for a writer to have a background character think to themselves. He knew he was just a background character, but like <laughs> in, in the course in the course of so doing, revealing like actually there's kind of a monster lurking here it's a monster who who we kind of like but it's still a monster yeah and and his level of self-awareness in the things that he does is so diametrically opposed to what we've seen in taylor's um lack of self-awareness in a lot of the things she does and i think that shows it here he knows who he is he knows his place um he's very upfront and honest with everything in his uh -huh. own head uh, which makes it even more horrifying. Yeah, right. That's interesting. Taylor thinks she's a protagonist. She, <laughs> yeah, she, she probably, yeah, she does. She's so vain, she thinks the story is about her. <laughs> uh, so he continues controlling her all through the meeting with Coyle, or at least 
while they're heading to meet Coil. Um, it's not really important. He he enjoys controlling Shadow Stalker. He really enjoys it uh, more than he enjoys things in his own head. Being Alec pales in comparison. Uh, you know, his emotions are muted and hers are normal. He wonders if dealing with his father's abuse has messed him up and, and made him this way. Uh, he, he thinks about how at one point he didn't speak for half a year after one episode where he was hit with mortal terror just for making noise and that that was just one of a dozen or so experiences like it. Um, and then he muses that maybe it was his own power that made him this way um, because, you know, maybe it's his power that's encouraging, you know, he, he, he feels the emotions through his puppets that he barely registers himself. So, so he wants to have the puppet so that he can feel those things. Yeah. And I think that speaks to the brilliance of this section. Um, because here we have this character who's doing disgusting things like the entirety of this chapter. Uh, Alec is his actions are awful, but we also have these moments like this where we're explaining them. We're, we're, we're sympathizing with him. We're understanding what he went through. I mean, here's a guy who basically admits that he's murdered, um, that he's raped before by taking control of other people and having had them have sex with him. Um, he's done so many disgusting things. Um, but like we're, we also pity him. And it's amazing that you can, you can juggle these two things at the same time. Yeah. I think part of it is that we, we like him already. Um, like we liked him before this. Um, and so we're biased in his favor. Yeah. And and the other thing I've really, I really like is, is how wild Bo writes it. Um, because so if it were me writing it, I don't think I could help, but put my own personal disgust towards his actions into the prose. Like I, I wouldn't be able to stop doing that, but Alec is a sociopath. He is like emotionally dead and he doesn't see like he would not react in disgust to any of the things that he's doing. So Wild Bo has to write this from this cold sense of indifference and he pulls mm -hmm. it off because it, it, as much as the terrible things are happening, the narration doesn't portray them that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he even has self-awareness that like a normal person would think these things disturbing, but he, right. but he just doesn't. Yeah. So he, he take I mean, even here he goes out of his way. He takes some time to, to torment her. Um, like he, he knows that she's not really going to leave town just because he says to, so he means to really hammer the point home. So he, he is being a bit calculated about this. He's not just getting his kicks here. He's, he's basically terrorizing her so that she will actually leave. So he starts going through her pockets, tossing things off the roof. He finds her personal phone and her wards phone and he unlocks them using her muscle memory. And he's going through her text messages and finds some juicy evidence of the abuse of Taylor. And when he finds this, another thing I'd like to pull out, long seconds past, he knew he should feel bad for the dork, but he only felt annoyed. He felt worse about the fact that he didn't feel bad than he did about what he just read. Um, I like this. I like it a lot, too. Um, it's very telling about it. It is it is three, four sentences that perfectly describe who Alec is as a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like he and it makes us like him i think it makes us like him because he's like he he's he's almost like what i'm feeling right now is basically alex's version of extreme outrage because i'm actually <laughs> feeling annoyance about this um so and that tells us that he's actually outraged on behalf of taylor in in on some yeah. level right like does that make sense yeah so yeah. And, and he he it's like he he wants to feel these emotions and that's part of the mm -hmm. reason why he gets all these puppets is because he can't he doesn't feel these things um mm -hmm. and he wants to and there's something sympathetic about that that's someone that like it's not that he's intentionally cold and indifferent it's that he just can't feel that and mm -hmm. that's that's it's sad i feel bad for him yeah totally he also probably should be in prison <laughs> yeah yeah, I think he'd do well in the birdcage, actually. <laughs> so so he emails the chat logs to her school and the police. Uh, uh, then he has her call Emma and and has her say 
that she misses her, really misses her, and has been in love with her. And Emma is, is furious with her and hangs up on her. Yeah, I, I think this is one of the only things that I really got a sense of enjoyment in the chapter. Um, because, like, <laughs> you know, Emma's probably, like, even if nothing else happens in, in this chapter, like, that's something that Emma's not going to forget about <laughs> and mm -hmm. is going to give her shit for. And I don't know, it's just it's just a very funny, weird thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this whole this whole scenario is so creative and yeah, and, and interesting. That's yeah. So yeah, he figures out Sophia's home address from the maps and the phone, and he goes there. Um, at, at first, he's losing his grip on her uh, because he's moving her further away, but then he gradually moves her closer to where he is and closer toward her house, and he gets he gets uh, control again. It's obvious that she's not supposed to be here in costume from from her family's reaction. And he goes out of his way to cause conflict with her mother and outs her as a cape to her brother, who seemingly didn't know that she was. Yeah, I mean, we're just seeing him, like, systematically destroy every last strand of her life. Um, school, home, with the wards, like, he's just step by step destroying her. Yeah, yeah. Um, and But he's not done yet, Scott. Of course not. He he grabs an he grabs an extension cord. There's something like beautifully cold about all the all the steps that Alex is going through here. He, he grabs an extension cord, and he makes an elaborate show of burning Emma's face out of all the pictures of her, and writing a melodramatic suicide note, um, and then making a noose out of the extension cord, taking the time to look up how to do it on YouTube um, to make sure he does it right. Yeah, I, I love that you pulled out the YouTube beat because um, I did. I do think it elevates that sense of horror because he's so calm, he's so collected and calculated that he it takes time to just casually like Google how to tie a noose, um, and it's just it it's terrifying. Yeah, and and through all this, like the, uh, up till up till about this point, Sophia has been been furious and affronted. Um, but this is only when she starts to feel like terror because she sees what he's actually planning on doing yeah. or seems to be. Yeah. Um, sp speaking of little tiny things, th there's this moment he put her hood down and then set the alarm clock inside her hood, blinking 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Um, it's just a visual of this, you know, dead unplugged alarm clock sitting in her hood as, as he's, you know, put the noose over her neck that I find yeah. like it's super, striking it's a really weird image right like at first yeah. i didn't understand what was happening and then i had to reread it and i was like oh it's just like it's very powerful it's very visual um and geez it's it's tough to, it's tough to read yeah um so b then ultimately though he pulls back just from the brink of killing her and, and actually as as i read it he may very well have meant to kill her like he, he kicked it, it says he kicks the chair out from under her hard but it doesn't topple over and so it's like, OK, well, did he did he mistakenly not knock it over and then he plays it off and he's like, OK, fine, I won't kill her. Um, or or was he just messing with her? What do you think here? My interpretation that was that he he was probably never going to kill her. Um, I think it was it was mostly showboating to manipulate her emotions and make things clear. It seems to me that now that he has tasted this power again, um, he doesn't want to so easily get rid of someone who. Um, he could easily use again, but he wants to manipulate them to a point that they're not going to be a threat to him. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't think he was going to actually kill her, but I, I think your interpretation is just as valid that it could very well have been that. And he just decided to go with it. Yeah, I, I think you're probably right. I just that that interpretation occurred to me. Um, all right. Anything else you wanted to bring up about the Alec arc? Yeah, let's talk about morals. So, sure. so um, I, I love that how Wild Bo constructed this, that he took a character that we hated um, because I hate Sophia. She's terrible. And we had a whole chapter in the last arc where we made sure you understood just how terrible she was. And then we put her in this moral dilemma where we say um, she's having these awful, these objectively awful things done to her. But does she deserve it? Do, do you think that the treatment of Sophia here is justified by her previous actions? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, like, if I'm being like, like, uh, my best self, then I'm then I'm gonna say no. But I got to admit, when I was reading this, I wasn't thinking poor Sophia. Um, like I was, especially the first time I read it, I was probably fairly psychopathically rooting for Regent here. Um, and, and I know that you, I know you had a different experience. Yeah, that's I, interesting. I don't know how much of that is you being a better human being than me and how much of it is, um, and how much of it is the fact that I read it quickly and, and not, not very analytically, uh, relative to how you're reading it. Um, yeah. So I, yeah, I, I don't know. I was frankly surprised that there was even a debate about this because <laughs> it, she's, of course she's awful. Like she's, yeah. there, there's no denying that, but this is terrible. I mean, this is cruel. This is torture. Um, this is above and beyond what any human being deserves. And if you're going to if you're going to play with an eye for an eye, then everyone's just going to end up blind. And uh -huh. it, it's just like this is this is so bad. Like I, I was disgusted by all this. Like like I and that kind of gets into the next thing I wanted to talk to you about, which is that the character of Alec disgusts me. I do not mm -hmm. like him at all. Um, I, I don't like, I, I'm not rooting for him as much as his motivation is, is kind of tied to his wanting to get back against the person who hurt Taylor. Um, and that's friendly and, and good. Um, I, he disgusts me like I, and, and so I want to talk about the idea of the difference between a well-defined good character and a morally good character, because mm -hmm. I'm sure there's people out there who just heard me say that I don't like Alec and their immediate reaction is, how can you not like him? And I'm like, I'm not saying I don't find him interesting. I find him fascinating as yeah. a character in the story. I love him because he's ripe for conflict and, and narrative and plot and can be used in very interesting ways. But as a human being, I hate him right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my go-to example in this discussion is Sansa Stark in, in Game of Thrones or Song of Ice and Fire, which uh, most people know who that is. So I think it's a safe reference um, that so many people, I, I've seen so many arguments and discussions about about her character where people are like, I, I hate Sansa Stark. She's terrible. She's a terrible character. And I'm and my position is always she's um, she's terrible in the sense that she's she's supposed to be a a like stupid young person, but she's a great character. Like she's right. drawn, she, she appears to you exactly as she is supposed to. And that is, it is a hundred percent intentional. She's a great character and she's terrible. Bo yeah. Both are true. Right. Those and, can, and, 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 yeah. Yeah. Those, those are not mutually exclusive at all. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I, and the hatred of Sansa Stark drives me crazy because like on some level, you're supposed to be annoyed with her. Like that's the intent of the story is like right. George R. R. Martin is telling you like through his words that this character is annoying, but that doesn't make her a bad character that makes him a good writer. Right. Yeah. It's not, it's not like he's unaware of what he's doing, but it's, right. yeah, it's mind boggling to me. And I think that's, you know, this is a, this is a great time to bring that up because um, I think Alec is a great character. Yeah. Um, and he's a, bad person and that's fine yeah. yeah no absolutely absolutely yeah okay all right uh that, you know we could talk forever about about alec and i'm sure we'll have opportunity to in the future um but uh let's let's move on to dragon's interlude uh, so it turns out that dragon is an ai which i don't think i predicted i did uh, not Scott, either you not did. at all no in fact okay. i was convinced that because i had a friend who predicted this uh, to me a few weeks ago and i was mm -hmm. like no you're not no, no i'm pretty sure we've seen their face that can't be true uh -huh. yeah right i mean I, yeah i love the i love that we actually see that kind of thing explained uh, yeah so so she's not your usual ai uh she was specifically built with several key limitations she thinks slower than a real ai would uh but she's she is still faster than any human but she has lots of artificial limitations one she can only have one instance of herself uh instantiated at any given time which um which is obviously 
you know, limits her relative to what she could be if she could copy herself. Mm -hmm. So consequently to all this and all these limitations, she has no memory of the battle with the Undersiders because that fork was destroyed before it had a chance to upload his memory. Or at least she lost part of the memory. I'm not entirely clear on the details there. Well, I think I think she lost the entire memory as it was reporting from that machine, but she was able mm -hmm. to gather things from uh, records and video of the fight. So she can see everything external that's connected to the net, she can see, right? But it's just the internal stuff, like her conversation with Taylor, yeah. she cannot remember. Yeah, I think that's the main thing. Is she she knows all the she she knows enough to fake her way through it, but she didn't remember what she said to Taylor. Yeah, right. Um, she feels a lot of resentment toward her creator Andrew Richter. Uh, he was a tinker who tried to do good. He didn't have a cape name. He didn't seem to have a cape identity. He just tried to do good, and he basically made AIs that would go out on the internet and mess with bad guys' systems. Is my impression. Mm -hmm. Um, and and he made her as basically like his Jarvis, his his like his uh, master AI for all of his systems. Yeah, but not, not Ultron. At least not, not yet. Ultron. No. <laughs> yes, perhaps uh, interesting. Um, so she, she spends some time checking in on the various birdcage prisoners. It, we, we basically enter a part where she's just like checking in on things. So she's checking in on the various birdcage prisoners. Um, we get conf confirmation that Bakura is indeed dead, sort of, because she's been quote-unquote revived by Glass de Wenye. Uh, we don't really know what that means. <laughs> no, uh, I don't. I don't even have a guess, to be honest with you. Yeah. And I think at this point, it's intentionally vague. Oh, we see that Canary has settled in and is adapting, although she's depressed. Yeah, I, I love there's a beat in here where she's thinking Dragon had to obey the authorities, even if she didn't agree with them. Mm -hmm. And this ties into kind of what she said to Canary when she was sentencing her. But um, I, I like I like how like. I think we're going to get into this more with Dragon later, but this idea of authority and Taylor's resistance to it and Dragon's forceful adherence to it, even though she doesn't mm -hmm. want to, is very in a very interesting foil of each other. Interesting. Yeah, that, I hadn't thought of that. That is a, that is a fairly explicit foil, actually. Uh, so she she's looking in on Lung and sees that he has made a new BFF. Marquis, who was another cape from Brockton Bay back in the day. And we learn, and we may already know this, but regardless, we see that Marquis is Panacea's dad. Um, and he has some kind of power that lets him like extrude his bones, basically control bone. Um, um, he is concerned that some other capes may be executing a vendetta against him that could lead to Panacea's death. So he kind of wants to find out more information and, and maybe help her if possible. But obviously he's in the birdcage. Um, yeah, this is really interesting. Um, I, I don't know quite what to make of it yet, but I hope this means we see more Panacea because I really want to see more Panacea. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I don't know what to do with this information yet, but it is very interesting. I enjoyed this uh, dinner between Marcus and Long. Yeah, this is a great, great conversation. And doesn't doesn't Dragon take the um, basically summarize the conversation and, and say she's going to send it to uh, Panacea's mom? Yeah, yeah, she does. Yeah. Okay. And then she checks in on the Inbringers, vaguely describing them just a little bit more. We see Behemoth, um, the burrower, who I, I think I think you you had said before that you kind of had this impression that he's like lava and and earth based. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we also see, did, did we know before that there's a pattern to their attacks, like a, like semi-regular intervals? I, I think we knew there was enough of a pattern to where it could be plotted by mm -hmm. a dragon, but nothing specific. I think the only okay. thing specific is that at least Leviathan is drawn to places of heightened conflict is the only okay. real information we had. Okay. Um, Eidolon says that Leviathan is lurking in the deep, mending, and the Simurg... Um, is flying high in the thermosphere, winged and apparently sleeping. So seems like my element theory is is checking out here, Matt. It it certainly seems like your element theory has some validity because I I pretty sure I never tipped my hand on that one, but wings do certainly suggest a, a, a wind element in some way. Yeah, and they're all located in their major element. One's in the water, one's in the air, and one's in the earth. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, right. Um, so she finally checks in on Colin, you know, our master in his, uh, cushy <laughs> prison. 
uh, with the jacuzzi. I was uh, right. She looks, yeah, you totally, I, fairly exactly right. Uh, so she looks through all his files to make sure he's not plotting anything, uh, but she kind of knows he isn't because she knows that he knows that if he escapes, he'll be caught and sent to the birdcage. So he's just not going to try to pull anything. Yeah. Um, even in prison, he's he's trying to help. He's mass producing the tactical visor technology that he had used. Um, maybe he's actually humbled now. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think he just needs something to do. Um, yeah. Like if, if we use the idea of powers as like you have a compulsion to use your power, um, mm-hmm. then a tinker would feel the need, the compulsion to be building something. So uh, this is something he's allowed to build. So he's going to build it. Um, and, and this is like super powerful. I mean, we've seen how powerful these visors are. Like if we're concerned for our girl, Taylor, hearing this news is like, oh, so they yeah. need to do something about this. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Uh, so we gradually realize as they interact that the two of them are kind of flirty. Um, most of most of it seems to be coming from Colin and in a very colony way. Yeah, leave it up to him to be in love with the robot. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so while she's talking to him, she thinks more about uh, Richter, and we learn that she's essentially frozen and unchangeable in a lot of ways because he's dead. He was the only one who could really modify her. Um, and, th- th- you know, she was just like a, a master system AI, but she had repur- repurposed herself into a hero as best she could. But um, that was within the limitations that had been established. She was never meant to be that. She thinks about Saint, who is the leader of the Dragon Slayers, who are the mercenary group who re- repeatedly bested her stolen her technology and, and trapped her. Um, and she hopes that maybe Colin could be capable of breaking her free of her restrictions. Yeah. And I think that's the most important beat of all this is not just that she's frozen, but that she has this need to get around that restriction, um, mm-hmm. that she, she has this need to better herself and increase her power. And, um, she's kind of searching for someone who could help her do that. Um, totally. and, and that's scary. Mm-hmm. yeah freaking how right yeah i mean she she thinks to herself at some point in here like oh richter you'd watch too many movies why is he afraid of an ai being power hungry i need more power <laughs> right right and and it's interesting you wonder if that that power hungry nature is was programmed within her if that's something the ai developed that richter wasn't uh, considering um, and I, I suspect we'll find more about that later but um, it certainly is concerning um, especially how the chapter ends with her uh, targeting Skitter uh, for, for some reason that we're not quite sure on yet but yeah. um, the the thing that I wanted to call out here was um, we learn a little bit about her little fetuses that she made them basically to keep it so her technology could not be used by others mm-hmm. um, that like the dragon slayers could not steal her technology. Um, and she's really cold about these guys. Mm-hmm. Um, she says they don't feel pain, which I think we kind of know is not true. Um, based on the thing crying out to Taylor as it died, as it died. Um, so uh, this, I was hoping to, to learn more about them than we got here, but this is enough to make me greatly concerned about what she's doing. Um, and and like, I don't know, like I'm very I'm very concerned for Taylor and her interaction with this AI. Yeah, it, it's it's funny. I'm I'm thinking about how having had a significantly premature baby, I'm probably biased in favor of the little mewling pinkish creature. Um, but uh, that's a that's a side note. That's a personal <laughs> yeah. story there. Or would you put it in a machine and then blow it up? I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't. <laughs> blow it up. I might put it in a machine. It depends. Well, that's very different than putting it in a in a giant dragon mech that that is programmed to have to sacrifice itself. <laughs> yes. Um. So her and Colin talk about Skitter specifically because he's trying to figure out how that conversation actually went and what actually happened. Uh, Colin takes a little bit more responsibility for that situation than we might have expected him to. I, I feel. Yeah. I mean, it's not like he's a paragon here, but he actually yeah. seems to feel bad about it. I think he he does. I think, yeah, it's a level of every time I met with her, she was worse. 
I never thought she would go that far. Um, and, and he's right, I think, like, because because we never thought she would go that far either. Um, obviously, he's not innocent in this whole thing. He's kind of a, a scumbag of a person, too. But, yeah, I did like this this kind of human moment in him um, where he he felt like he was at least partially responsible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I like that. Uh, she she leaves Colin and then she takes about five seconds to figure out that Skidder is Taylor based on. You know the fact that she has access to all the data in the world. Yeah, those that those Alec text messages really did not help her. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, that. No, I think I did make that connection the first time I read this, but I forgot about that. That basically, Alec's attempt to 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 be stand up here has has actually backfired. Yeah. Um. She. I, I like. I'm just gonna pull this quote out. Um. Because I think it's pretty on the nose for Taylor. The danger was that with the bullying, the girl might be inclined to see things in terms of us against them. Her interactions with the heroes thus far certainly hadn't put them in the us category. This might also explain why she had gravitated back towards the undersiders even after the chaos Colin had sown by revealing her intentions for joining the group. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's it's all pretty correct. I, I love that too because it's someone who's never had any actual interaction with her and just has her pegged perfectly. Yeah. Um, the power of data. Yeah, right. And 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 somehow illustrating Taylor's lack of self awareness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and she it ends saying she's ready to act the moment the girl resurfaces. But act on what, Matt? I don't like this. Is yeah. I, I kind of love this cliffhanger because we know she's interested in Taylor. We know a lot about her. We know enough to be concerned about her. Um, but we don't know how Taylor can help her with whatever she wants. You know, like. It seems like it's more than just I want to catch her. It seems like it's it's more than just I want to imprison her. So I, I'm very curious. Yeah, it's really interesting because in this arc, we've been introduced to the idea of the Slaughterhouse Nine as upcoming villains, um, but also the idea of Dragon as an antagonist to Taylor, although she's not a villain. So she's kind of getting it from both sides. She has the very powerful Slaughterhouse Nine and then the very powerful Dragon, um, right. you know, potentially looming yeah. from both sides. Bad guy and good guy, and Taylor caught in the middle once yeah. again. Yep. Yeah. Cool. All right, Scott. So that wraps up Arc Ten Parasite. Uh, any 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 further comments, or shall we move straight on into your speculations? No, let's let's do some speculating. All right. Okay, so um, I wanted to go through some of the ones that we got confirmed right or wrong this week. Um, one of the ones I had said near the very beginning was that Rachel was going to be the one to intervene in Taylor's school bullying problems. I, I'm ready to call this wrong just because we saw specifically that Alec had a part in that and the way their uh, Taylor and Rachel's relationship is right now um, doesn't seem like that's probably going to happen. Um, we can change it later if something else happens, but I'm pretty confident now that that was incorrect. So I'm okay. going to mark that wrong. Um, Another one was we haven't seen the last of Lung. Technically, we saw him, so I'm going to call that right. But but still, I think Lung is going to play in in a much bigger role still um, outside of just this random uh, scene with an interlude. Um, I think he's going to get out of the birdcage eventually and do some some fighting. So uh, I'll, I'll I'll call that one right, but I'll say I'm I'm doubling down on it. Okay. I was right on Arms and Masters retirement just being a fancy house arrest. Mm -hmm. um, although he is a little uh, more unhappy with it than I figured he would be. I figured he'd just be posting up enjoying life and he seems like frustrated and he's not eating a lot. And he, she describes him not looking great, but mm -hmm. uh, close enough. Yeah. So the final one that Taylor rejoins the undersiders with caveats. Now I'm going to let you make the call on this because I was half right, but I don't know if, if the caveats that I was referencing when i made this prediction have come to pass um so i don't, I don't know what do you think yeah um th th they didn't really put any stipulations on her you know they, no. it's it's not like they're even giving her like probational membership they're just they're giving her membership but they're all kind of pissed at her yeah um yeah. and i i guess i wouldn't call those explicit caveats um i mean i'm gonna i, I would count that like 80% right in, in terms of <laughs> in terms of like yeah she she did rejoin them mm -hmm. and it wasn't it they didn't it wasn't with open arms right. the only person who really who really welcomed her back was was Tattletail um 
and uh and yeah. uh it, All right. We we don't know how things stand now, so yeah, I, I, l- largely correct. Although there were no explicit caveats. Okay, I'll make it like a like a greenish yellow. <laughs> that sounds good. That's that's a very, um, uh, yeah. All right. Um. So I do have a couple new ones. Um. I'm gonna say that that our our main villains of the book, the Slaughterhouse Nine, are in Brockton Bay to recruit their ninth member. It was made explicitly clear that there are only eight of them. And uh, they will attempt in some form to put Alec into that ninth member. I just think there's just too much synergy between these horror people being introduced in the same arc as uh, the horrible nature of Alec's power is introduced. So mm-hmm. I think those will those tie in thematically too nicely for that to not happen in some form. So okay. And then I think Sophia is going to be done with awards. Um, probably not from her own choice. I think the fallout of what Alec did is going to show that she's violated her uh, ward probation in some way. Um, So I don't don't know what happens with that. I guess they put her in prison, Um, but I I, I don't think she's done with the story. I think she will be, be a factor in the story going forward, Um, but she's will no longer be uh, a ward. Okay. And that's all I got for this week. Awesome. Scott. All right. Um, well, that wraps everything up for this week. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed our discussion and hearing Scott's reactions. As always, we appreciate your feedback, and we're always trying to improve. So let us know if you have any advice, questions, or thoughts on this week's episode. You can reach out to us via email at uh, gotwormpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at gotwormpod. My personal Twitter is at scottdaily85, that's D-A-L-Y, and Matt's is at mordinamail, and I'm not going to spell it. Don't. Don't do it. Uh, if, <laughs> but follow us. But fo- I won't spell it, but follow us. Yeah. If, if you're not already subscribed to We've Got Worm, we strongly recommend you do so and uh, never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, Overcast, and pretty much anywhere else in the world you can listen to podcasts. And as always, you can find this, all the other podcasts we do, all of our writing, essays, film and TV criticism, and more at www.dailyplanetfilms.com. That's right. We also have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash dailyplanetfilms, D-A-L-Y. Uh, you guys have been so generous so far uh, that we're in the home stretch, actually, toward our next milestone goal, the quarterly worm fan art contest. Um, please donate a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. A special, gang, uh, special thanks to our new donor and the first at the associate producer level, Brent. Uh, there's a good chance that Brent has already read this before I'm saying it, uh, because one of his rewards at that donor level is a copy of this script and notes that Scott and I take in preparation for this podcast. Uh, Also, a thanks to a new producer-level donor, Corey K. Uh, You guys make this show happen. Thanks so much. We appreciate it so much you can't imagine. Uh, Also, while you're over at Patreon, make sure you stop by Wildbo's page and toss some money to him because he's the guy that makes this whole thing possible. Yeah, and as always, if you're one that can't spare any of that extra cash, we we do completely understand, but there are still tons of ways to help us out. Um, If you are listening via iTunes, if you could go there and rate and review it, that would be really helpful. Matt, we've got so many rate and reviews on, I think we're up to like 15 reviews on Mm -hmm. uh, the new feed, which is uh, like really cool. Like that's... Um, it, it's it's still a small percentage of our listeners, so if you if you guys <laughs> want to keep it up, uh, that would be great. But just the fact that that iTunes like their format is such a pain, so the fact that people go out and take the time to actually do that means so much to us. Um, thank you guys so much. Keep it up, uh, and and always if you could just share this podcast with your worm friends and worm virgins alike, uh, plant that worm seed in them like some sort of I don't know, Matt, a <laughs> parasite. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's certainly the effect Worm has had on my life. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, we're going to get into Arc 11, Infestation. Uh, Scott, Infestation, what does that call to mind? What do you think that thematically means for the next arc? Uh, well, um, I should have prepared for this since I knew we were going to do it. But um, I'm kind of thinking that... Um, we're going to play into the Slaughterhouse Nine a little bit, so maybe um, they're going to 
like with my prediction, this will be the arc where they reach out to our boy Alec and try to um, infest him. <laughs> I, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I like that you brought in your prediction and, and what I think are some valid uh, extrapolations from what we've seen here. Tying it all together. Yeah. Alrighty. So uh, a reminder that this is going to be the first arc uh, that we'll have to divide into multiple episodes due to its length. So next week, Part one will deal with chapters 11.1 through 11.8. And then the following week, May 24th, we'll tackle the remaining eight chapters of this arc, uh, which are the multiple interlude chapters 11.a through 11.g. So see you guys next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.